Welcome to The Road Show. I am Karen Jensen Salisbury, and I'm your host for today. Thanks so much for tuning in. Listeners, we are in for a real treat today, so get ready. On today's program, we're excited to welcome Pat and Karen Schatzline. They are international evangelists, and their ministry is called Remnant Ministries International. They're based in Fort Worth, Texas. Pat and Karen, welcome to The Road Show. Thank you so much for having us. We are super fired up to be with you. Thank you, and we're just excited to be able to share with you today. Yes, we are so glad to hear from you. Pat, just for some background, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves and about Remnant Ministries? Well, you know, uh, Karen and I have traveled the world. We've traveled about 3 million miles uh, doing ministry, leading the I Am Remnant movement and watching, uh, I think we've seen about 2 million souls touched. We travel every single week, and we've written uh, six books. Actually, I've written nine total, but six, uh, three of those were collaborative, six together, uh, Karen and I, and we've seen, you know, our passion, our vision is to see people have an encounter with God. And uh, for years, we spoke at, you know, massive youth conferences, and then as God began to shift that you know, we really feel a holy call to just be a fresh voice of seeing people encounter the Heavenly Father, seeing people encounter the presence of God. So we see a lot of really cool things happen in our services. And of course, our family is, uh, we have a 27-year-old son who's married, and we've got two grandsons. They lead a big youth ministry out in California, and our 16-year-old daughter, Abigail. And so um, that's who we are. We also are CEOs of a health company where we help people take back their health. And so we're trying to find some more stuff to do. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds like you stay plenty busy, don't you? Tell us about the I Am Remnant movement. You know, the I Am Remnant movement was I wrote a book uh, called I Am Remnant that went kind of viral around the world. And the I Am Remnant movement is was a holy call from 80 to 8 years old for people to rise up and make a stand for truth, because today, you know, truth is a new hate speech. And Romans eleven five says, so too at the present time there's a remnant. And all throughout history, God has always awakened a remnant to be the voices of truth, to stand uh, for, you know, against the, even the lies of culture and according to God's Word. And so throughout the years, we have seen thousands and thousands of young people and adults rise up and say, I will be the remnant. I will make a stand for biblical truth. And so our last one we did was this summer, and we saw just hundreds and hundreds touch. We were with a pastor named Pastor John Kilpatrick, and uh, it was Karen and I and uh, Karen Wheaton and some of our friends in ministry, and that was back in June, and it was an incredible move of God. So it's a weekend outpouring. How can we find out more about that, like if I wanted to get involved with the I Am Remnant movement? They can, people can go, they can call our offices directly, or they can go to raisetheremnant.com, raisetheremnant.com, and check out information on it. And uh, what we've done, like, we're getting ready to go to South Africa at, uh, we, Karen and I really believe that we're missionaries to America, and um, that that's, that's our heartbeat, and it even says that on the back of all our books. So, but now, at the end of September, we're going to South Africa for Pretoria Day, where we're expecting to see about 25,000 lives touch, and it's basically an I Am Remnant movement there, and then Portugal. But it's where we go into a city for a weekend on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and just watch God shift mindsets and hearts towards Him. And young people, for whatever reason, we've always had a huge drawing of young people, so they really get rocked by it. That sounds awesome. Karen, you have a ministry called The Breathing Room, which just sounds so restful. I like it right away. Tell us about that and how you got that name. Well, you know, it was kind of birthed out of um, obstacles and everything. Uh, I had been uh, diagnosed with a cancer diagnosis, and um, on my 49th birthday, Pat asked me what I wanted for my birthday. And I'm 50 now, but on that birthday, he kept asking me what I wanted for my birthday. And I just, you know, I thought I have an amazing husband. I have an amazing family. Um, I don't really need anything. But in this season of my life, what I really want to do is just kick the devil in the face. (laughs) (laughs) Good idea. um, 
Yes. And so I went to prayer and, you know, through just, you know, intercession and praying during that season, uh, right after I was diagnosed, um, you know, God laid it on my heart that, you know, it's through his breath. Uh, Job 33, 4 says, the spirit of God has made me, but the breath of the almighty gives me life. And I thought to myself, you know what, that's what I need. And that's what so many people around the world need is a fresh breath. I mean, we live our lives with, you know, things that come against us, the enemy attacks us and constantly wearing us out to the point where we feel like we just can't catch our breath. We just can't, you know, get ahead. And, and that deep breath that we need, you know, so many times we have to reach for our spiritual inhaler and say, (laughs) God, breathe your, you know, your breath inside my lungs so that I can live just like the word says, you know, the thief may come to steal, kill, and destroy, but God comes to give us life yes. and to give it more abundantly. And so that abundant life is a life full of breath and joy and purpose and destiny. So we decided that we would launch uh, the breathing room, and it was based just off of that, Job 33, 4, because you know what? So many people are just surviving, yeah. but we were never called to survive, but to thrive. Right. And, you know, the only way we can do that is create an atmosphere in our life, create an atmosphere in our home, create an atmosphere no matter where we are for the breath of God to flow. And when that happens, when we create a place for us to meet with God and the breath of God comes in, it fills our life up to where it strengthens us, it invigorates us, it gives us the courage and the boldness that we need to run after God. And so we launched the breathing room and now, you know, it's a bi-weekly Facebook live program and it's reaching, you know, anywhere from 25 to 50,000 people um, each episode. And the goal behind that was, you know, whatever you're walking through, we're called to overcome. So on that program, we discuss issues and how to overcome them through the breath and the power of God. Wow. And so it's on twice a week. Uh, yes, it's uh, generally twice a month. Twice a month. Twice I'm a sorry. Month. Okay. Um, so every other Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. And that's on your Facebook page, just Karen Chatsline? Uh, yes, on my public page, just Karen Chatsline. And that is spelled S-C-H-A-T-Z-L-I-N-E for those of you who want to find it. Yes. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. I just get refreshed just hearing about it. Praise uh, God. You- so, and now, Karen, I was watching one of your guys' videos on your website, and you've been on Daystar and TBN and God TV and all sorts of uh, shows. You guys see a lot of healings and miracles in your ministry. We do. And, you know, it's crazy because, you know, the beginning of the healings that took place is everywhere we would go, we would see uh, scars on people's arms disappearing Wow! from cutters who had self-harmed, you know, and mutilated their body. And, you know, we would see those scars disappearing in services. Pat would preach at conferences and conventions and youth conferences, and young people would come up and turn in their uh, the razor blades and different things where they had self-harmed. And Pat went to prayer and he said, God, why are we seeing these healings take place this way? And God spoke to him and said, when I do a work on the inside, it manifests itself on the outside. And we began to see those. But then since the cancer diagnosis and praise God, you know, we went on this journey and God radically healed my body from being diagnosed with leukemia to, you know, uh, eight months later, you know, getting a report from the doctor that my blood is completely normal and healed. And so through that, in all of the services that we've been going uh, and ministering in, through the power of God that shows up in those services, that people are being healed of spinal issues, of migraines, of hearing issues, of depression and discouragement, and marriages are being healed, but physical healings taking place. People who are getting uh, positive uh, test results back after being diagnosed with cancer and different things like that that we are seeing on a regular basis. Isn't it just like God to take what the devil meant for evil and work it for good? You know, one of the things that we've always said is that, you know, a tragedy has trajectory, and it can either restore and push you to your next level or steal your identity. And what we have figured out is when people begin to realize 
that what they've been through is a good indication of who they're called to. When they begin to realize that if God trusts you to go through it, he's going to bring you through it on the other side. Sickness is not from God. We know that that was taken care of on the back side of the cross. The front side is where our sin was forgiven. But people that are, you know, if you're listening right now, I want you to understand, if you're in a battle, hold your ground, hold your faith. But the day is going to come when God's going to let you minister to that. And that's how you punch the enemy in the face. Yes, that's just how he does it, isn't it? Listeners, we're talking today with Pat and Karen Schatzline here on The Road Show. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about their new book called Restore the Roar, Defeat the Spirit of Fear with the Breath and Power of God. You've heard Karen say that she had cancer and she got healed of it. We're going to find out how that happened and how they beat the spirit of fear, which is something I think we can all identify with. And so uh, you don't want to miss this. We'll be right back. I'm David Warren here with some exciting news for Oasis listeners. We have a new mobile device app. It's free, easy to download, and lets you enjoy our refreshing music and talk everywhere you go. If you have an Android cell phone, go to the Google Play Store. And if you have an iPhone or iPad, visit the Apple Store and search for Oasis Radio Network. Be an Oasis ambassador and share this news with family and friends around the world. There's food for the hungry, joy for the sad. I found an oasis of love. Oasis Welcome back to The Road Show. I'm Karen Jensen Salisbury, and I'm your host for today. We are delighted to have our guests, Pat and Karen Chatsline. They are international evangelists and they're authors. We're going to talk today about their latest book called Restore the Roar, Defeat the Spirit of Fear with the Breath and Power of God. And they wrote this book after Karen received a diagnosis of cancer, which she alluded to in the first segment. Karen, start us out from the beginning of the story. Um, Well, the beginning was kind of out of nowhere. Um, We were doing live, and we had not yet moved to Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, and we were in Birmingham, and I was standing at the kitchen sink just doing dishes, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God overwhelmed me, and I heard the presence of God say to my spirit, you're about to walk through a difficult and uncertain season, but do you trust me? And in that moment, I would love to say that, you know, I'm a woman of faith and power, and I just embrace that and say, God, let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> but the truth is, I rebuked it like it was the enemy. Yeah. And, you know, again, I heard those words, you're about to walk through a difficult and uncertain season, but do you trust me? And in that moment, I realized something, that God was preparing me for something that the enemy was going to attack me with. And I had to make a decision in that moment. Do I trust the word of God? Do I trust everything that I know is true? And because God wasn't asking me about my faith, because faith is a result of our encounter with him. He was asking me about trust, because trust is a result of his reputation and our relationship with him. And so it was about, you know, maybe five or six months later that we were in Fort Worth and I started developing symptoms that sent me to the doctor on a journey to where I finally ended up at an oncologist's office. And I was sitting there with an oncologist looking at me saying, Karen, you have leukemia. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I was immediately taken back in my spirit, remembering those words standing at the kitchen sink so many months prior that said, do you trust me? And in that moment, I made a decision I made a conscious decision in my spirit to say, I'm going to trust God. No matter what happens, I'm going to trust God. And I said, you know, I don't receive that diagnosis. I reject that diagnosis. And I said, because it's like if my kids bring home a stray dog, I'm not going to name it. Because if you name it, you keep it. You're keeping that dog. It Mm. becomes a part of the family. And so I asked the doctor not to call it leukemia anymore, but to just, check my blood. Every time I came in, I knew what I was there for. I wasn't in denial. I wasn't in, uh, you know, uh, this place where I was, uh, you know, crazy. I understood what he was seeing in the natural, but I had decided that it was not mine to keep. And that took us on a journey from that point on. 
I guess so. And so then you say at one point in your book that when you became focused on helping others, you started to get better or healed. Exactly, because, you know, I think sometimes when crisis and turmoil and chaos come into our life, we become so inward thinking it's all about us. And I think sometimes we have to realize, just as Pat had mentioned, that what you go through is a good indication of who you're called to. And when I got that diagnosis, I had mentioned that, you know, that's when God gave us the burden and the the dream to start the breathing room, because I thought to myself, if I'm going to walk through this, I know there are so many other people out there who are walking through circumstances and situations yes. and bad diagnosis, and it, we're going to walk through it together because, you know, Psalm 23 tells us, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. That scripture tells us that darkness is going to come. We live in a fallen world. Issues are going to come our way. We're going to walk through the valleys and the shadows and all of those things, but we can keep walking. Walking, but we're also called to, as we're walking through that, to grab as many hands as we can and pull them out to the light with us. So when we walk through things, if we lean into the presence of God, if we allow the breath of God to flow in our lives, then we will be able to see clearly ahead, on the other side, on the shore, in the midst of a storm, and we can take as many people with us as we can. And that's what we're called to do. He'll take our test and make it our testimony. You know, one of the things that happened when we decided to write this book is because the Lord spoke to my heart after the diagnosis, and then Karen was radically healed. And uh, But, you know, I always say that it's easier to, to backslide after the battle because the sister of fear is lethargy. And that's what the title of the book, Restore the Roar, came from. The Lord spoke to me, and he said, where did your roar go? And I said, Lord, I don't have a roar. It was at the end of it. And um, he took me to Amos chapter 3, verse 8. It says, as the lion roars, so the prophet speaks. And it took us on our journey, looking backwards, of how fear is crippling this right. generation. Yeah. And, you know, fear is, it, it fears the embryo of courage. You can't have courage without fear. But how the God, when you, it's on the other side of it, that you begin to say, wait a minute. And so the whole book, even the opening chapter, is we didn't want to write this book yeah, because what you write about, you'll fight again. <laughs> That's yeah. the introduction to the book. We were afraid to write this book. <laughs> yes, because I've learned that what you write about after years of writing books, you know, what you write about, you'll fight again. <laughs> and so I, I think it shocked our publisher, Charisma, when we said we're going to call it that. And I said, I'm calling it that, that chapter, that, because it's the truth. The minute we decided to write the book, nightmares began. Other stuff started happening, and we just got up and took authority over that. Yeah, now, in one place in the book, Karen, you say, speaking of taking authority, you say, if the devil throws lemons in your life, please don't make lemonade. Like that old saying, you say, don't do it. That's absolutely right, and here's why. So many times we think when issues come into our life that that's just our lot in life. We just have to make the best of it. And the enemy, you know, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us the, you know, that the enemy is a thief. He's a liar. Yes. There's no truth in him. So he's every day dishing out, dishing out all the junk, all the lies, all the sickness, all this. And we're receiving it like it's just a buffet. And we're taking it and applying it to our life. So my philosophy is if the devil throws lemons in your life for the love, do not make lemonade. <laughs> Throw them back in the devil's face and ask for a full-on espresso because God called us to live the full-on espresso life full yes. of abundance, full of joy, full of purpose, full of healing, and full of restoration for our family and our children, our marriages, our health. We've got to start living according to the Word. And if we are God's children and He's a good Father, then He takes care of us. He lifts us up out of the darkness. He lifts us up out of sickness. He says in His Word that He heals. And if we believe that, then we can walk out of the darkness and into the Life. Now, I know there were days for both of you in the midst of this cancer battle um, that you both faced fear. So talk a little bit about what you did on the days to stay strong, to stand up to the devil, to throw the lemons back in his face. You know, what did you do when fear tried to overtake you? 
Well, you know, I'll dive in on this, and I'll tell you, I would get up every morning, and we would sometimes we were just coming in from a trip because Karen refused to slow down during this season. Uh, we stayed, uh, you know, traveling, traveling, traveling. We had just launched our last book, uh, Rebuilding the Altar, and uh, called a Holy Encounter with God. And and so we're traveling like crazy, but we would get out of bed, and I would immediately say, Alexa, you know, play Surrounded, or He Still Moves the Mountains. And it would go through the whole house, and we would get up and begin to worship. And I later found out, you know, we wrote about why the lion roars, and there's five different reasons, but one is it roars in the morning and the evening. And I realized that we were actually doing that. We would get up and worship and go to bed and worship. And if you'll do that, God will be right in the middle of your today. And what we began to do was I would literally personally, as as dad, as husband, I would get up and even as Karen was making her way out of bed, and sometimes mornings were tough, I would just begin to pray in the Spirit. And I would begin to say, God, you've got this. We've got this. I would literally, there was times, I wrote about it in the book, where I would walk through the house and say, you cannot win this devil. Yes. You cannot have my family. You can't take my sweetheart of 29 years. And peace would come over the house. You know, peace is not an emotion. It's a place you got to choose to live. And Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, you keep in perfect peace whose mind is set upon him. He's the peace that passes the understanding. And so that means in my understanding, I can't do it. But even when we get ready for doctor's appointments or whatever it was, but I would choose to say, and I'm, the other thing I would do is walk through the house and roar scriptures, declare scriptures through the house. And, you know, one of my favorite chapters of all time is Hebrews 11, the where it says, Sarah, judge God faithful. And we would literally get up in the morning and say, God, we judge you faithful. Regardless of the outcome, we judge you faithful. Yes. And Karen, how about you? What did you do on the days when fear tried to overtake you? What I love is that fear is not the absence of courage. You know, fear is actually the embryo of courage. Fear is courage waiting to be awakened. And so I think so many times we think fear is failure. But, you know, without fear, there's no need for courage. And so God uses, can take that, what the enemy meant to destroy you, and actually birth new courage and purpose inside of you. And there was one morning particularly that I got up and I was overwhelmed. Fear was overtaking me. And, you know, I just went into my prayer closet and I said, God, you know, I know he took me to the scripture, 2 Timothy 1, 7, that says God did not give you the spirit of fear, but of power, love and a sound mind. And so I read that scripture and I said, God, I know you didn't give me fear, but I'm afraid. And he started speaking to me about researching the the actual tools that he gave me. And that was power, love and a sound mind. And when you research those words, power literally means the ability to change the course of events, to see miraculous signs and wonders. It's the ability to change the atmosphere. So I don't have to have fear. I can walk in and change the atmosphere with his presence. And he gave me love. And the Bible says perfect love casts out fear because love is, God is love. And that's why First Corinthians, the definition, it's patient, it's kind, it's not self-seeking. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. But I love that he gave me a sound mind, which is what I needed the most on yeah. those days. And if you look at that word, it comes from a word, sophroneo, that means a mind that has been delivered, rescued, revived, salvaged, protected, brought into a place of safety and security. So it's no longer affected by the illogical, unfounded, and absurd thoughts. So when fear comes into our lives, God was trying to show us, get up, go into his presence, change the atmosphere, know that you're always protected, you can trust him and persevere, and that you can distinguish between the lies of the enemy and the truth of his word in our life. He really does give us all the equipment that we need to have victory, doesn't he? Absolutely. Amen. Well, listeners, we're talking today to Pat and Karen Chatsline, and we're talking about their book, Restore the Roar, Defeat the Spirit of Fear with the Power and Breath of God. No, that's the breath and power of God. (laughs) And you can find out more about the book at RestoreTheRoarBook.com. Pat, tell us what we'll find on that website. You know, what's amazing is all of our other books are on there as well. Why is God so mad at me? The book... Uh, that I wrote in uh, He's Not Mad at You, He's Mad About You, Defeating That Lie, and then 
I Am Remnant, and uh, Karen's, and then Unqualified book, God Raised Up the Unqualified, Karen's book, Dehydrated, and then Rebuilding the Altar. All of our books are on there. And then you can also find contact information about Karen and I and Remnant Ministries International. And so go to RestoreTheRoarBook.com. You know, we've been amazed. This new book in two weeks' time has exploded uh, on Amazon three times in different categories at the number one, because this book is speaking to a felt need. People want fear out of their life so they can step into their destiny. You can also connect with Pat and Karen on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We're going to take a quick break right now. When we come back, I want to ask you, Karen, to tell us more about our weapons against fear, how we use them, how everyone can use them to overcome fear in their life. And we'll be right back after this. The Road Show is a listener favorite, which airs each weekday here on the Oasis Radio Network starting at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Central. The Road Show also has a great section on our website, oasisnetwork.org. There you'll find audio archives of select past interviews, plus guest lineup and contact information, and links to our Road Show sponsors and its hosts. So join us for The Road Show, whether on your radio, computer, or mobile device at oasisnetwork.org. Welcome back to The Roadshow. I'm your host, Karen Jensen Salisbury, and our very special guests today are Pat and Karen Schatzline. They've written a book called Restore the Roar, Defeat the Spirit of Fear with the Breath and Power of God. Karen, one of the things you say in the book, I love this, fear will try to greet you every morning and work toward creating an absolute in your life. With cancer looming in the shadows of my life, I needed to know what weapons had been given to me to fight this war. I needed to understand that fear was not meant to be my companion. Tell us about that. Well, you know, that's when God showed me the Second Timothy 1, 7, that he didn't give me fear. He gave me power, love, and a sound mind because, you know, fear is just a learned or perceived aberration or hallucination that grows into an absolute in our life. So the enemy comes in and he plants a seed of fear in our life. But what we do at that point will determine whether we live in a place of fear. And, you know, we wrote in the book, uh, let your praise be louder than your fear. I think in those moments, you know, many times throughout our life, you know, Pat and I have determined that worship is our nerve pill. Worship is how we make it through those moments. And so when the enemy comes in with fear, you've got to turn up the praise, begin to praise God for what he's already done, begin to praise him that he's never left you, never walked out on you. You know, Psalm 34 says, I bless God every chance I get. My lungs explode stand with his praise. And, you know, I think another thing we have to do is sometimes it's just as simple as turning on the light in the midst of the darkness. And, you know, many people think, well, it's not that easy, but Psalm 18 tells us, God, you floodlight my life. I'm blazing with glory. I can smash the band of attackers, jump over obstacles. Every God direction is road tested and everyone who runs towards him makes it. And so sometimes I think it's we make it too complicated in our life to overcome, to get to a place of conquering that fear in our life. When God has given us every weapon, there is a roadmap in front of us to lead us down the right path, to lead us through the right directions. You know, I keep going back to Psalm 23 that says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, because we're going to walk through that. But later on in that scripture, it actually tells us that goodness and mercy pursues us all the days of our life. And so many of us are always looking at the shadows around us, but we should be looking for the goodness and the mercy that follows us every day of our lives. Yes. And as I read your story, I find a whole bunch of places where it seems like God was preparing you or he was so very present with you. Like when you went on your trip to Brazil, your ministry trip, and you were supposed to have the bone marrow biopsy afterwards. And Pat was in another part of the world, but God spoke to him in a hotel room, right? Didn't he tell you something in a hotel room, Pat? Well, you know what happened was is Karen was getting ready to walk on stage in Brazil, and the Holy Spirit says to her, the enemy was really attacking her mind, 25,000 women, and God says to her at that moment, I feel your blood. At the exact same time, I was actually in a church service, the Holy Spirit said to me, at the exact same moment, the storm is over. Uh. And 
together, I raced to the airport. Our daughter was with me. Karen's in Brazil waiting on her to get off stage. I'm in a Philadelphia airport. And I called her and I said, God spoke to me. And she said, no, God spoke to me. And we're going back and <laughs> forth. And both of us, and that's when that she was healed. And we came home. And I'll let her tell what happened when she walked into the doctor's office because I did a Facebook Live after that and was a pitiful mess. <laughs> I tried to share the testimony in front of the oncology, and it's been seen by, I think, 100,000 people. But I started crying and couldn't talk and had to hand the phone off. And uh, I'm not a very good testifier. I'll just start. I'm, <laughs> I'm a walk-in lifetime movie. And so here's Karen. I'll let her tell you what happened when we came home. Well, absolutely, because we came home, and as Pat said, you know, I was walking up on the stage in Brazil, and what the enemy does to inflict fear is he starts mocking and taunting you and throwing up what you see in the natural. But, you know, uh, I was walking up on the stage, and he started saying to my heart, he started saying, you're a fake, you're a fraud, you're a liar, you're about to step up on stage and talk to 20,000 women about healing, about hope, about restoration, about freedom, and you're going to die of cancer. And in that moment, there was a roar that rose up inside of me, just like we talk about in the book. And I began to quote scriptures in my mind. I began to quote all the scriptures that God had given me. And I said, devil, you're the liar. Because I'm going out and I'm going to speak to these women about what I know God has for them, about what I know is going to take place, about what I know to be true about his character and who he is. And that's when God spoke to me and said, right when I walked up and opened my notes and said, your blood has been made whole. And we came home, you know, the next very next day, we had to go in for the bone marrow biopsy. And when we walked into the office, took the blood, got sent to the office, the doctor walked in with the biggest smile on his face. And he said to us, after all these months and months of bad tests, he came in and he said, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know how to explain. Explain it. I have no answers for it. But today, your blood is completely normal, and there is absolutely no sign of cancer in your blood. And we just began to shout yeah. because it was just that moment of seeing the healing manifested that we already knew was going to happen because God has assured us that this diagnosis was not for us. Praise God. I know I'm encouraged. You, you can't see me, but I'm running around in the studio here. <laughs> yes. Glory. What a yes. good testimony. And one of the things you talk about at this point kind of in the book is about the paralysis of analysis, which is, as you mentioned, Karen, the battlefield of your mind where the devil keeps accusing you. Pat, talk a little bit about that paralysis of analysis. You know, I wrote a chapter called The Shadow Looms and how you feel like something is going to happen. So it just freezes you. It just puts you in the pause mode. And the Bible says all good and perfect gifts come from above. And it goes on to say where there is no shadow. And I talk about the paralysis of analysis, how the enemy will turn you into the possum. You just freeze up right where you're at. You know, I tell a story in the book that when my son was little, he would wake up in the middle of the night, like every kid, he would see shadows. He would see, you know, something under the bed, daddy, something's in the closet. So what we did was we took a white bottle and I took this white bottle, put water in it, wrote Holy Spirit spray on it. Yeah. And I would walk through his room and he was in the middle of the night, daddy over there. Now he's 27 years old. He actually tells this story at massive youth conferences because he leads about two or 3,000 young people out in California uh, in a big youth ministry. And I'd walk through his room and he'd say, daddy over there, daddy over there. And I would squirt that water and I'd say, Holy Spirit's got it, Nate. Holy Spirit's got it. Perfect. And, and he'd go back to sleep. Now, I don't encourage you to do that because it will mildew a good carpet, I'm going to tell you all right now. <laughs> but the, the whole concept is the paralysis of analysis. If you consistently or constantly wait on something negative or, man, it's going to go bad, you're never going to step into your destiny. All through God's Word, the great ones, from Moses to David to Simon Peter to Jesus in the garden— Everyone faces fear. And one of the things we wanted the book to be is not all about the, the cancer battle. We wanted to give people an understanding that fear is that lie. I love what Billy Sunday said. He said, fear knocked at the door. Faith answered, and lo, no one was there. Yay. And you have to 
Make up your mind to get out of bed every morning and live somewhere between amen and there it is. Realize you got to get to heaven with nothing left to do. And fear is a liar. It's a crippler. You know, I say this all the time, but faith is to the believer what fear is to health. When you begin to rise up in faith, when you step into what Karen talked about, living not just in faith but in trust, you're able to look at that thing and say, you cannot have me this time, devil. Right. I am going to dream big dreams. I'm going to launch a business. I'm going to step into my destiny. Quit analyzing and start trusting. Praise God. You also use that, uh, those, these fear analogies in the story of the first days when you adopted your daughter in China. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, God had given Karen a dream. We had tried to have another child for many years, and God gave her a dream of uh, a baby calling out to her from China. So wow. two and a half years later, we go to China. And I'll never forget that late one night, our daughter, when she came into our lives, and people always say, boy, it's so great that you rescued her. And we say, no, she rescued us. So she's 16 years old, and she is amazing, going to change the world. And uh, she owns my heart. And if you don't believe it, you can just look at my credit card statement. But anyway, um, uh, but and by the way, if you're driving in Fort Worth, stay off the road because she's learning how to drive right now. and It's not good. But I'll never forget. She was struggling big time with what they call night terrors. And apparently she had had them pretty much her whole life. And every two hours, she would just scream out in her sleep. And we're in a hotel room. We're exhausted. We're on the other side of the world. We're in China. And finally, I got up in the middle of the night and turned on worship, and I saw this demonic figure in the corner, and I began to speak to that figure, and I said, you cannot have my daughter. She is mine. She has my last name now, and we have come, and she is a part of us. And I watched as I began to pray in the Spirit, as I began to rebuke it. I watched that thing go out the window. We write about this in the book. I watched it crawl out. And the next day, I didn't think anybody was awake. We're all in a room, a hotel room. The next day, we're on a flight, and Karen looked over at me and said, I saw it. And I said, you saw what? She said, I saw that thing in the corner, and I saw you speak to it, and I saw wow. it have to leave. And by the way, she never had another night terror after that. Praise God. Because we have the authority to break fear off our family. We have the authority to say, you cannot have my home. Yes, we do. That's the power of God part in the title of your book. Amen. Amen. Well, listeners, we're talking today to Pat and Karen Schatzlein, authors of the new book, Restore the Roar, Defeat the Spirit of Fear with the Breath and Power of God. You can find out more about the book at RestoreTheRoarBook.com. And you can also find out more about their ministry and about their life at Preaching the Gospel on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. When we come back, let's talk with them about more about breathing and the breath of God, how it can breathe life into all of our situations. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. Oasis listeners, there are so many good reasons to visit us at oasisnetwork.org. You can access song information, our business sponsors listed by category, details on your favorite radio programs, plus our popular online listening. And while there, click on the Facebook link to like us and stay up to date on what's going on here at the Oasis. Again, our internet website address is oasisnetwork.org. Oasis Welcome back to The Road Show. My name is Karen Jensen Salisbury. I'm your host. And our very special guests today are Pat and Karen Schatzlein, authors of the new book, Restore the Roar, Defeat the Spirit of Fear with the Breath and Power of God. I know, Pat, that in one part of the book you talk about how when people are afraid, they tend to go into hiding. Talk a little bit about that. You know, I always say the greater the anointing, the greater the isolation. And I wrote a chapter, one of the chapters I wrote in the book was called The Hidden, that, you know, when you're afraid, you go hide. You hide under the bed, you hide in the closet, whatever it might be. But it's in the hiding that God does His greatest work. It's in that season of where you're in that hiding, from Moses in the cliff to David in the cave to Simon Peter running through the night, all through God's Word, you know, 
isolation, that season of disappearing, is when God is actually, what the enemy is meant to, to bring you down, all through God's Word, it's in the hidden that he raises you up. It was Joash hidden in the temple for six years when God would raise him up. And so I wrote about the fact that don't be ashamed of your hiding season, because it's actually when God is cultivating and making you great. I really believe this, that God is about to raise up the nobodies. He's about to raise up the ones that everyone else would say, well, you're not that big of a deal. You know, we teach that a lot in the remnant conferences throughout history. It's the nobodies that change the world. And that the day of Christian celebrityism is over. It's about being voices for him and rising up. And so the old chapter was, if you're in hiding, don't be ashamed of it. This is when God's getting ready to reveal you. I love that. That is epic. And Karen, one of the things you say in chapter seven, that was one of my favorite things in the book, busyness is not a spiritual gift. Absolutely, because I think when I got the diagnosis, you know, so many times we say we have faith, but I learned that season, it is incredibly easy to say you have faith until you are the one that needs the faith. Right. And, you know, we can talk about faith all day long. And so, but then there's another level, that trust level that requires us to literally lean into the presence of God and not trust on our own abilities. But I think there was a season there, you know, Pat uh, mentioned it earlier, that I wouldn't slow down during that season. I had been diagnosed with uh, leukemia And I decided that I was going to go harder, I was going to go stronger, I was going to go faster than I ever had because I was going to outrun that diagnosis. I was going to outrun what the doctor was saying to me. And there was one day that I was so exhausted. We had went and went and went. Pat had tried to get me to take time to rest. He had tried to get me to not push so hard. And I remember getting up one morning and I just felt like I had been hit by a truck. My bones hurt, my muscles, my every, my head hurt. You know, I was having all these symptoms from the leukemia. And I went into prayer and said, God, what is wrong? Why am I not seeing a breakthrough? And I felt him speak to my spirit so clearly. And he said to me, Karen, busyness is not a spiritual gift. Whoa. And he said to me, he said, if you would just slow down long enough to hear what I'm trying to tell you, if you would slow down long enough to listen for my still small voice that's trying to guide you, that's trying to direct you. And I think sometimes we busy our lives with the busy work of ministry or the busy work of trying to earn our healing, trying to earn our freedom, trying to, you know, work our way into that breakthrough. And sometimes God wants us just to get in his presence and breathe, just like, you know, the book we talk about, just breathe, because the Bible tells us in Genesis 1-2, the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, but the Spirit, that word spirit means breath, was hovering over the waters, and God spoke, or he breathed, and there was light. See, literally, God breathed across the darkness, and when his words went forth and he breathed, light literally burst forth out of the darkness. And in our lives sometimes, when we're walking through those dark seasons, when we're walking through those situations and those uh, things that come up to hinder us, if we would literally stop long enough to listen to God's voice, then the light of God's presence will burst forth, burst through the darkness in our light so that we can see what he wants us to see. And there's five things that the breath of God does that tells us in the Bible. The breath of God, his breath gives us life. It breaks the spirit of fear. It drives out darkness. It brings understanding and it heals our dry bones. Those are the five things that the word of God tells us that the breath of God does for us. So we have to take time to listen and allow his breath to flow through us. I just think that's so good. In today's world, we are all just so busy. It's almost like our badge of value, our badge of, you know, worth. So what, practically speaking, what did you do? Because I'm sure your life is super busy, having heard about everything you guys do. 
practically speaking, what did you do to maybe slow down or take the time to hear the voice of God? Well, we literally went into our uh, office and we sat down on our calendar and we canceled certain things that were on our calendar that uh, we needed to cancel in order to take time to rest and take time to lean into God's presence and to not busy ourselves, to not do the busy work, you know, the the things, the filler stuff, you know, because right. so many times when our minds are being attacked or our bodies are being attacked or our families are being attacked, we feel like we have to fix it. Yeah. We have to come up with a solution. We have to come up with the answer. And so we busy ourselves with things that don't matter right. and things that don't serve value in our life. And so we had to go in and we had to cancel things on our schedule and cancel things so that we could rest our minds. We could rest our spirits. We could rest our bodies so that we were stronger to run the race that God had for us. That is a word in due season for some of us, isn't it, listeners? Yes. <laughs> oh, my. Yes. So, Pat, tell us a little bit uh, as we end here, the five reasons why a lion roars. Absolutely. You know, number one, the lion roars to declare its location to other beasts. You know, the wicked flee for no reason, but the righteous are as bold as lion. You know, the lion's roar, you can hear it literally five miles away. If it's wow. up next to a deep, it can shake the bolts loose. How many of you that are listening right know that we have the Lion of the tribe of Judah? He roared 2,000 years ago, and it still reaches us today. He went to the cross as a lamb, but ended up as a lion when he declared he's finished. The lions also roared to show their strength. I just want to, you know, tell everyone out there, the Bible says that the lion roar for no reason unless it's caught its prey. Here's what I want to tell you. It's time for us to know where you stand. Where do you stand? Draw a line in the sand. What do you believe? When's the last time you let folks know, this is what I stand for? So they, they roar to declare the locations. They roar to declare the strength. You know, the Bible says the wicked run away when no one is chasing them. The third reason is they roar to warn others this is their territory. I want every mom, every dad, every grandparent out there to understand that there's a moment where you say, this is my family. This is my home. These are my children. We know the devil acts like a lion, First Peter 5, 8. But it says, be sober, be diligent. We know Proverbs thirty thirty: the lion, which is mightiest among beasts, does not turn them back before any. And then the last two reasons is they roar when they're hungry. Listen, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Yes. And I already said it earlier, but they roar in the morning and the evening. If you'll learn how to get up and praise in the morning and praise at night before you go to bed, God will handle the rest of the day. And by the way, that's also when you light the altars morning and evening, you know, when we wrote about that. But it was so interesting when the Lord spoke to us and said, where did your roar go? And I said, Lord, I don't have a roar. We've survived. We're on the other side of this, but I'm exhausted. That's when you have to roar the most is on the other side of the battle. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Karen, as we end the program today, will you pray for our listeners? Absolutely. Father, we just come to you today, Lord. We pray that right now, whoever's listening, every person, whatever they're walking through, whatever they're facing in their life, I pray that your breath will begin to blow through wherever they're at, that you'll wrap your arms around them, that you'll show them your love, show them that they're never alone, that they can trust you, that if they will lean into you, that whatever is in their life that is bringing fear, anxiety, overwhelming them, that they can lean into the power of you in their life. If they don't know you, Father, I pray that they receive you right now as their Savior into their life and that you would bring power with you as you enter into their life, power to change the atmosphere, love that casts out all fear because they can always trust you and persevere and a sound mind so that they can determine what is a lie from the enemy and what is the truth of your word. And I pray that right now, if there's any out there that are sick in their body, that healing oil will flow right now, Father, and that they would be made whole, that their blood would be made whole, that their bodies would be made whole, and that they would be free from sickness, disease, and the issues that are pulling them down into a place of darkness. And we just thank you right now, and we praise you, Father, 
for who you are and what you're doing in their lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Karen, near the end of the book, you say, this is your now. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, I refer to um, Esther in the Bible when she was faced with a hard and difficult and scary situation. And she had a moment in that situation where she could shrink back and just think about herself. And she used that moment. She realized it wasn't just about her. You know, through that diagnosis, I had to look around me. It wasn't just about me. I couldn't feel sorry for myself. I couldn't think poor, pitiful me. I had to look around. I have a son that's 27 years old. I have a daughter that's 16 years old. I have two grandsons. I have people that I pour into on a regular basis. And sometimes the people around you need to see you survive because one day they may face things in their life and they need to see you survive so that they know who to run to when they face difficult seasons. I want my kids, my grandkids, and everyone that I come in contact with to know, you know what? The enemy tried to take mom out. The enemy tried to take Gigi out. But I saw that she ran to God, and God never failed her, never let her down, because I want them to know that he is a good, good father and that he will always be there for them. So I had to look beyond myself, just like Esther did, so that generations to come, my kids, my grandkids, my grandkids' kids, would know the power and the love of the Father who is in heaven. That is so good. Listeners, I'm so glad you tuned in today. We've been talking with Pat and Karen Schatzlein about their book, Restore the Roar, Defeat the Spirit of Fear with the Breath and Power of God. You can learn more about their ministry and you can get the book at RestoreTheRoarBook.com. You can also connect with them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Pat and Karen, thanks so much for being on the road show with me today. Thank you for having us. It was such a pleasure. We have been so blessed with you to be with you, Karen. Thank you. And and y'all, we just want to tell you, this is your moment to rise up and declare the enemy. I'm just beginning. I'm rising. I'm going to the next level. Amen. On behalf of the Oasis Network, this is Karen Jensen Salisbury with my special guests, Pat and Karen Chatsline, saying thanks for listening today. It's been another great road show. You've been listening to The Road Show. If you'd like to write to us, here's our address. The Road Show, P.O. Box 1924, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74101. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. The views of today's guest aren't necessarily those of this station, but we do appreciate and thank our guest for spending this time with us. The Road Show, an Oasis Network presentation.